So today, I'm going to have a very short presentation and what I'm going to be talking to you about is the five conversations you need to have be having with yourself about money. In terms of the agenda, I'm going to be introducing myself, I am going to then um, tell you why you need to be talking to yourself when we grew up, it was crazy to even think that everyone would be found talking to themselves. But guess what? Research actually shows that it's out. And then what are the five things that you should actually be talking to yourself about? A summary and then closing. And obviously I want to thank the FBI for this opportunity. I'm extremely passionate about helping people to know more about money, guys. Because money makes the world go round. So who am I? Alright? I currently run a financial planning and advisory company called IWCP Preventers, which is based out of Woodbeat, and I'm a director there. I also founded Moms and Money, which I'm extremely delighted about and the progress we've made. And what Moms and Money does is it just helps moms become woke about money. We help them to understand how they can create multiple streams of income so that they can leave a financial legacy. When you look at the statistics in South Africa, 40% of the households are single income households that are actually led by moms. But when you also look at the statistics as uh, provided by the UN recently, women get paid 25 cents to 40 cents less than their male counterparts for every grant, for every dollar. So imagine they're breadwinners, but they're earning less. They survive on significantly less. So if you're a guy in this place, please bring your female counterparts. It's got TV they need. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say I'm blissfully married to one husband and I pray that it will be that way until death do us part. I also have two beautiful daughters that if I'm not speaking to people, talking about money, helping my clients, I am in the Lego there. We are playing hide and seek, we are doing play do things uh, because they're actually quite young, seven and three. And then last but not least, I was um, really privileged to be honored as uh, one of the Female entrepreneurs under 50 to be awarded um, an award by Vessels of Honor in 2021. For those that don't know me, please feel free to come after the session for a photo. Um, I have been to the You can hashtag me. Um, and maybe you can find one or two other catches. I have been featured on the Morning Live show on CNBC Africa, I have been on um, uh, Kai FM, BMCA, Carte Blanche, SABC News, YFM, to name a few. You the Yeah. What was the Carte Blanche one about? Jolly, and 
you say you don't have money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the whole ball. But can I ask you a question? From the day you decided you wanted to buy the ball, how many of balls did you start seeing on the streets, on the yeah. roads? Yeah. Not a lot. Not a lot. Jeez. Okay. The, your other peers can confirm that they start seeing more of that thing. No, after I bought it, then I started. Oh, okay. Uh, before I did that. Okay, so you have a slow starter. Yes. <laughs> What it does is, the moment you tell it something, it actually now starts, its antennas go up, and it starts looking for information to confirm the thing you've told it. So the moment you tell it, I want to buy a car, all of a sudden you start seeing more dealerships, you start seeing more of that car on the road, you start seeing more advertisements. I mean, they were always there, but now because your mind is consciously awake, you actually start seeing more of it. So what talking to yourself does, it gives you clarity. Which is why we say when you've got goals, speak them, write them down, because as you do that, you actually get more clarity. Whether you know it or you don't, now you do, you actually become proactive about looking for ways to make sure that those goals become a reality. Talking to yourself calms nerves. Oh my gosh, Parliament needs to start learning how to talk to themselves. Yes, okay. Because talking to yourself, Self-talk can actually help you if actually connected with breathing technique can actually help you to calm your nerves. So if you find yourself in a situation where you are extremely mad, guess what? Put yourself in a corner and start talking to yourself. Even if people don't understand, it actually has a way of calming you. Third thing is, when you actually learn to talk to yourself, it gives you an opportunity to reflect. Okay? It gives you the opportunity to think. This specific thing that I said I wanted to do, did I do it the right way? Was I able to achieve the things I set out to do? When I was growing up, if you talk to yourself, it was great, great. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I'm giving you the permission today. Because yeah. first of all, you get clarity, you calm your nerves, and you get the opportunity to reflect. Another very important thing that research has shown is that when you do talk to yourself, it reinforces things in your memory. So when, when you tell yourself, I want to buy a car, it goes into your conscious. But the more you think about it, certain neurons in your brain start to connect and it actually moves from your conscious to your subconscious, okay? Which reinforces memory. Which is why if you keep telling yourself something over and over and over again, it becomes second nature. Because you've now created enough neurological connections in your brain about that thing. Which is why if you think of billionaires like Elon Musk, They've got a very important routine that includes meditation. What is meditation? It's continuously repeating certain things to yourself. Affirmations, continuously repeating things to yourself. So I want you to say to yourself, I am a millionaire. I am a millionaire. Okay, some of you don't believe it. I can see the way you're rolling your eyes and like, hey, you have not seen my bike. Can we clarify the currency? <laughs> Muscle memory and you start executing it as if it's second nature. 
But what these sports people do is they also talk to themselves. I am the best footballer in the world. Mm -hmm. I am the best basketballer in the world. I am the best tennis player in the world. Because guess what? Your brain eventually helps you to execute to the point where you become the best at what you do. So, if you see FBI members from today speaking to themselves, don't be like the same artist as that. She's motivating herself to be the best um, employee in this place. So, what are those five things you actually need to be talking to yourself about? The first one I'd like to introduce you to is what I call stewardship. So, a lot of people get money. And they get good money for it. I mean, some people are even buying up out Johnny's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. A lot of us actually get good money. But you'll be amazed. Even the people that are in the top 10% in this country still have to borrow to survive. Mm -hmm. Because they've not learned the art of stewardship. So what is it being a steward? It's being a good money manager. And yes, you can give your money to Alan Gray, you can give it to Stanley, you can give it to Coronation. But if you're not able to manage what you receive and make it work for you, even if you give it to Alan Gray, you still watch it. So stewardship is a very important conversation you need to have with yourself and ask yourself the questions of the money that I receive. How much am I spending? And I'm hoping that that number is not going to be more than 100%. Because mm -hmm. then you've got a serious problem, okay? But of that amount, how much are you actually putting towards short-term savings, like an emergency fund? How much are you putting towards your medium-term goals? How much are you putting towards your long-term goals, like retirement? Okay? That is stewardship. Do you have good debt versus bad debt? What proportion of your income are you actually utilizing in order for you to create long-term wealth? Okay? That's for me, stewardship. Are you a good money manager? But at the same time, I would like to ask you guys, how many streams of income does the normal or the average millionaire have? Any idea? Five. Five? Ten? Twenty. Twenty. Oh, how many hours? Twenty streams of twenty four hours. Okay, so the average millionaire has seven streams of income. Okay? Seven streams of income. Whether it's through investing, it's through venture capital, it's through um, resale of goods, the average millionaire has seven streams of income. How many do you have? No. Okay? And it's okay, you don't have to tell me, you can count it on your toes, keep it a secret between you as yourself, do that self talk yourself. But it's important that we actually become more aware as stewards to make sure we've got more streams of income. And I always say, remember I talked about self-talk and it motivating you. Never stay in bed until you know that you can be making money while you're in bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Because some of us are married to our blankets. Okay? We are married to our sleep. And yet, sleep in itself, if it's not generating revenue whilst you're sleeping, then you mustn't be doing a lot of it. I will... Talk about Elon Musk because I think he's achieved quite a lot for himself. To have Solar City, to have um, Tesla, and now to have um, SpaceX. 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 And? Twitter. Oh, it's now X. To now have X. All successful listed companies on stock exchanges all over the world, world I think is phenomenal by any standard. I mean, most companies, I mean, most people can't even have a single company move from private to public. Now he's done it for four companies. And before that, remember, he's the one who was behind uh, PayPal. Massive company today that was extremely successful and that allowed him to actually kickstart or um, fund Tesla. So I can safely say five, okay? Do you know how many hours the guy sleeps? Two, four. Okay. Four. And he's got five successful companies we can rope in and look to him for. You have one stream of income, sleeping <laughs> 10 hours. And you say, you like me. You like your salary increase. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. So in being a good steward, okay, I always advocate for what you call good debt relative to 
bad date. So good debt is the debt that helps you to A, increase your net worth, okay, or it helps you to increase your ability to earn an income. So examples of if you buy a property and that property increases in value over time, that would be considered good debt, okay. If you buy a school, if you, if you get debt to fund scooters that then go on to Uber Eats, that would be considered good debt. Why? Because over time, you repay the debt or actually use the repayments on that uh, or revenue generated from that scooter business in order for you to actually generate more income for yourself. Taking out a study loan, only if what you're going to study will help you get a higher salary. Yeah. <laughs> okay? yeah. Because there's some people that keep studying, but they're stuck. Yeah. Okay, Because they're not upgrading themselves to market relevant, um, with market relevant studies. So if you take out a student loan that will allow you to get more opportunities to become more marketable, then definitely good type of debt. Bad debt is the debt that is consumptive in nature. So credit cards that you're using to buy clothes, credit card being used to buy food, credit cards that are being used to buy things like hair pieces, to go and do your nails, to go and do your hair and that. I'm getting on the women here because they're the culprits. But when you get debt like that, it actually reduces your net worth. It reduces your net asset value. So you want to have debt where the asset value increases whilst your debt is decreasing. Okay. So that's conversation number one, stewardship. The second thing you want to do is what we call work protection. And I'm sure you guys hear about this a lot of times, but the implementation is what I see a lot of people lack on. Okay? So we'll say, you need this in your financial plan, you need this in your financial plan, you need this in your financial plan. A lot of people don't actually understand why they need it. Okay? So the second thing I want to ask you is, are you protecting your wealth? Now, who here bought something new recently? Anyone? You guys are not buying anything. Yeah. Yeah. Groceries. 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 Okay, let me ask. I am see virtue on all time. Okay, she bought an inverter. It's not even music because it's too dark. Um, okay, so you bought an inverter. All right. Now, let me ask you, uh, what's the most valuable asset you bought so far? Inverter. Inverter. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you, most valuable asset you have? My house. house. Probably your house. Okay. Most valuable asset? It's nothing. It's nothing? Don't have a house. Don't have a house. <laughs> Ooh, he's a bachelor. No, no, no. You just can't afford it. <laughs> okay. Most valuable asset? Um, car. Car. Okay. Now let me blow your mind. If I were to take your net earning capacity of a 40 year career, how much do you think you're worth? Anyone? So start with a mega salary of maybe 20,000 rand, non inflationary increase for 40 years. How much do you think you're going to earn over your lifetime if you retire at 65? Any cases? You can start a number. Um, 8 million? Sorry? 8 million? 8 million? Um, 2 million? 2 million? At the back in the corner? A lot. <laughs> Five million, sir? 1.8 million. He's finance, he got on the bus. Shock and horror. Yeah. 27 million. Yeah. Look. Yeah. 27 yeah. million is what you're going to generate over a 40 year career span. Which is why I'm always like to those black people that are like, I don't want to take out a will because uh, they'll come and kill me. Or I'm not going to take out my father because I'm going to die. I'm like, dude, is your life cover going to be 27 million? No, 500,000. I'm like, they're going to kill you for 500,000 when you're earning capacity over a lifetime is 27 million. Tell me which math did you do in Medellin? <laughs> because that, the numbers are not mething for me. But my point is, okay. You are your most valuable asset because of your earning potential, your earning capacity over your career. Okay, and remember, this is the plain vanilla situation. I haven't included bonuses, I haven't included inflationary increases, I haven't included promotions, and all those lovely things that come in life in terms of increasing your earnings. So, do yourself a favor when you do that self talk. 
Try and make sure that you actually enjoy your wealth price position, which is you. Income protection, great disease protection, future protection. I mean, there are so many different products out there. Do your research, but make sure you protect number one. Okay. So I have already talked about loss of income, which is a very important thing. And then the third thing I want you guys to actually talk about um, to yourself is retirement. Okay. There is a statistic I came across when I joined the industry six years ago. What percentage of South Africans retire comfortably? One percent. Five percent? Six. Rihanna, it's actually six percent. So six out of 100 is the official FPI number, FYI. It's six percent. Uh, and I used to ask myself, when I joined the industry six years ago, it was six percent. To date, it is still six percent because people are really struggling. Okay? They are struggling to put in place the appropriate um, resources that will help them for retirement. Okay? And what I want you to talk to yourself about is, what percentage of your income are you actually putting towards retirement? When I started in the industry six years ago, we used to say 10 to 15 percent is what you need to be putting away. But now because people are living longer, guess what? You actually need to be increasing that to 20 to 25 percent. Okay? Because 10 won't cut it anymore. Unless, of course, you're raising phenomenal children. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that will agree to build your cottage in their backyard, right? <laughs> and you can still eat the main food in the main house. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Unless that's your plan, you need to make sure that you're actually contributing between 10, uh, 20 to 25%. Now, just a few stats. Like Rihanna said, 94% of South Africans will not be able to retire after. Mm -hmm. So if I look at this room, we're approximately 20 about 20 people, okay? You need to start finding out who here is going to be the six, okay? okay? Of which if we are, if it's six in every hundred, that means in this room, <coughs> only one of us will have a decent retirement. <laughs> and it's probably gonna be me because I can't be seven. <laughs> You are not employable. 
and you have 190,000 set down for retirement. Now it becomes really, really important what you do now to make sure that in your future, your future self must thank you because now you can do Pilates at the beach, you can play bridge at the local club, and you can actually do bingo and be the rich aunt in your family. Okay. So again, just to give you an idea, why do I advocate for starting early? Because of that eighth wonder of the world called compound interest. Money babies making more money babies. Interest upon interest. So if you start at the age of uh, 25, guess what? You only invest 824,977 if you're only contributing about 500 rand. But the interest you earn is 5,172,053. If you start late, say at age 50, you actually want to accelerate the contributions, you actually end up putting in more capital, 3,121,000. But the interest you earn is only 2.8 million. So there's definitely a case for starting early. And I don't care, even if you start with 500, put that annual escalation of 6% or 7% because it makes a difference in the long run. Second thing I want to advocate for is when you leave the FPI, if you ever do, do not take your money. Do you hear me? What did I say? No. No. money between years 11 and 24 of your retirement savings. So between year 2 and 11, really your capital is just, yeah, playing with the boys but not with the big boys. And from year 11 to 24, that's where compounding actually really starts to make a difference. But what we've also seen is that a lot of people cancel their policies between this period, yeah. So you're not even giving yourself the opportunity to get to the 11 year mark so that compounding can do what it does best, which is to make your money work for you. So you can see between years 11 and 24, the contribution is about 32% of the entire value of your portfolio. So stick it out. Even if times get tough, continue contributing because once you hit that 11 year mark, that's where most of your money is actually going to be earned. As I said, there is definitely a cost to cashing out. Make sure you preserve. So this just shows for an individual that decided to cash their money after 10 years, there's a 440,000 opportunity <coughs> cost. At 20 years, 910, and then after 10 years, 1.7 million. So it's important that if you don't cash out, all right, this is what you end up with at the time of retiring. If you do cash out after 10 years, you, own, you actually lose out on the 19. If you cash out after uh, 20 years, you actually lose out on that 440. So fourth conversation you need to have to, with yourself is diversification. They always say never put your eggs into one basket. And I think this year is a true testament of why you must never ever put your eggs into one basket. Who here has got a 32 day account? Raise up your hands please. Okay, 32 day notice. And I'm not saying raise up your hands so that can come and borrow from you. No. Okay? Keep your hands up. Okay, 32 day notice. Money market account. Okay? Keep your hands up, guys. Um 120 day account. 60 day, some sort of like 60 day investment. Who here has a long-term investment? So five years or more. Okay, I'm glad. This, these stats are amazing. At least you are walking the talk like me. But, I always say the reason why they say 32 day account or 60 day account is a sign in the messaging. You must not be keeping your money in your 60 day notice account for more than the 60 days. Because literally if you do that, 9 out of 10 times, inflation is actually going to start eating into your capital. Okay? So what is inflation? Is the erosion or is a consistent increase in the basket of goods. But what it does is it makes you poorer over time. So if your money is sitting in that 60 day fixed deposit for longer than 60 days, chances are you're no longer being compensated for the time you are invested in there. So I always say your risk should compensate you, time invested should compensate you. 
So if you're not going to be investing for more than 60 days, do not keep the money in the 60 day account for five years. Okay? Because you will never be compensated for the term of the investment. But also, we tend to invest in what's familiar to us. Okay? We know the banking products, we are used to our banks. What could go wrong? Poverty is what could go wrong. Okay? So I say you can look at your nice zeros in the bank account and you can feel wealthy, but you're actually becoming poorer over time because of inflation. Which is why it's important to diversify. And if these numbers don't tell you the truth, I don't know what else will. So you'll see here over 15 years, okay? Cash. So what you're investing in when you actually invest in banking products is cash. Cash and cash equivalent products. Over 15 years, just slightly above inflation at 6.58. Sick and probably the worst performing asset class over time. Remember? Best performing asset class over 15, 10, and 5 years is global equity. So when you do yourself talk, ask yourself, what is my exposure to global equity? Do I have any exposure to global equity? Because if you're investing for 5, 10, and 15 years, guess what? That's probably where you're going to make the bulk of your returns. People invest in things like property, okay? And you, if you look at property, over 10 years, worst performing asset class. Five years, worst performing asset class. 15 years, one, two, three, four, five, number six. Okay, and this is listed property, okay? Why again? Because people are familiar with property. You know brick and mortar. You grow up with it and because it's familiar, that's the thing that we want. But do you have an appropriate investment case for it? Think about it and look at maybe a balanced fund. Can you see? You don't have to do too much thinking. Most companies will have a balanced fund. Maybe just invest in a balanced fund. Because in a balanced fund, you actually get a whole um, dose of all these asset classes combined into one fund. Right? So do yourself a favor, diversify. If you're not going to diversify at asset class level, then just get yourself a balanced fund and pop your arm. Then the last and probably most important conversation you should have about uh, have with yourself is about legacy creation. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if you have a will, all right, can you just show me that by raising your hand? Okay, excellent. I'm actually glad because in most forums I speak at, less than two hands go up, and yet your will is probably one of the most important documents you will ever have. More important than your investment statements, more important even than your ID, okay? Because once you're dead, you actually need a death certificate. The ID doesn't matter, but your will will still be speaking for you, okay? So if you don't have a will, please, please, please make sure that you actually have a will done, okay? Because the will is what puts everything together. You've diversified, okay? You've made sure that you've got those assets, whether it's lifestyle or business assets, or investment assets. At the end of the day, the will is what helps to put everything together in terms of the transfer of that wealth to the next generation. But if that all important document is not there, guess what? You will have to wait for the state to appoint an executor. Eventually, when they do find one, it's going to take them an awfully long time first to find your dependents or the people that they would term appropriate heirs. But at the same time, um, if you actually haven't done your will, it means that if you've got kids, then there's going to be a fight on guardianship. And most of us come from complicated family circumstances. Everyone wants to wake up. I had a colleague of mine. Her mom passed away. She had a half-sister. They never saw the half-sister's dad ever in her life. And automatically she assumed that the guardianship would come to her since she had grown up with her sister, they had lived together, she's 29, her sister's 13. They filed for guardianship. Guess what? This non-present father is contesting. He is contesting guardianship. He doesn't pay for school fees. He doesn't pay for groceries, nothing. He's literally a pain in the backside right now. And yet if the mom had that simple document called the will, the guardianship could have been finalized, they would have received the money that um, she, she, she saved at uh, uh, Bara, 
But now everything is at a standstill because the father is now challenging the guardianship. And yet if that one all-important document had been done, we'd have a different story today. So ladies and gentlemen, what have I been talking about? Number one, be a good steward of your money. Number two, make sure you protect your biggest asset, which is yourself. Number three, please start putting aside something for retirement. Number four, ensure that you actually diversify. And number five, tie all together with the valid rule that you update regularly. Any questions at this point in time? Okay, my contact details are there. If anyone would like to reach out to me, I'm more than happy to ask you guys pro bono because I am a faithful <laughs> FBI member. Before the other folks, the volunteer opportunities, I'm putting myself out there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. It was thank fantastic spending the day. Thank you. So now, thank you very much. I think we had lots of fun. Um, sorry team, we'll work on it next year, we'll be much stronger. Thank you for your time tonight and thank you for always being available. And tonight's also doing another session on the 6th yes. um, as a volunteer. So thank you so much just for the school, thank you to say thank you for coming.